This is Scott Becker with the Becker Private Equity and Business Podcast, the Becker Business Minute Podcast. Thrilled today to get to visit with Jay Goldman. Jay is the founder and I believe CEO of Sensei Labs, works a lot with private equity funds, looks at portfolio construction, operations, where private equity funds should spend their time with their sponsored companies, and a lot more. Jay, can you take a moment, introduce yourself, and tell us about Sensei Labs? Yeah, my pleasure, Scott. Thanks for having me on the podcast. Really excited to be here and to have a chance to tell you a little bit about what we do. So we are an enterprise software company. We have a platform called Conductor. Conductor is an orchestration platform. It's used directly by the kinds of companies that private equity invests in and buys out and those sorts of things to run their transform transformative programs. Those programs are usually a combination of the kinds of value creation levers that we see private equity deploy. So things like M&A transactions, cost reduction, revenue increase, pricing strategies, geographic expansion, all of those sorts of things. And Conductor is a combination of project portfolio management. So who's doing what and when and the governance and tracking of all of that work. KPI and benefits tracking, so being able to forecast and target against those critical KPIs for value creation, collaboration, and knowledge management all in a single platform. Thank you. And take a second on, on how you ended up in this sort of line of work, how you ended up doing this. Talk a little bit about your background and, and so forth. Yeah, so we started this actually inside of a parent company called Click Health, K-L-I-C-K. Click is a life science marketing and commercialization partner. So they work with biotech and pharma on a global basis. Click today is about 1,500 people. And we started off the leadership of Sensei Labs as members of the senior leadership team at Click. We had built an internal platform that in Click is called Genome, which is an orchestration platform for the agency. And we ended up writing a book about our experience creating that and our approach to building data-driven, talent-centric workplaces. And that book called The Decoded Company went on to become a New York Times bestseller, which was a fantastic thing for us. It gave us a chance to travel around the world and speak about what we were doing and the software platform that we had built. And everywhere that we went to do that, there would be a lineup of people who wanted to know where they could buy the software. And at the time, you couldn't buy the software. It was a proprietary platform we'd built. But we are entrepreneurs at heart. It didn't take us very long to say, you know, maybe there's a market for this thing that we've built. And so we ended up bringing to market that solution as Sensei Labs, which today is an independent company that we have taken some outside investment into. And we now run on a global customer base. We have customers across six continents, about 20% are Fortune 500, the remaining 80% are all kind of mid and large cap enterprise and uh, their private equity partners and their consulting partners. So we work directly with management consultants like Carney, who use us as their orchestration platform. We work with large systems integrators on digital transformations, and we work with private equity funds on orchestrating their value creation plans. Thank you very, very much. And what are you most focused on this year? When you look at private equity funds trying to sort of figure out are they investing right now, are they waiting until the second half of the year? What are you most focused on right now with your private equity funds and your and your sponsored uh, the sponsored companies? There's a really great moment in time happening across the private equity industry, and I think this is probably true regardless of fund size and investment strategy, that you have a rare opportunity to look inward at your operations, at how you think about value creation plans and structuring them, how you think about internal operations of things like due diligence and how you're going to get through that in a more structured, faster, more efficient fashion. Because of the slowdown in deal volume, and you know, we could get into all of the factors that got into that. I'm sure everyone's tired of hearing about them, but obviously higher interest rates and all of those sorts of things. It's created a, an environment in which funds have a significant amount of dry powder where they are expecting a return to deal volumes towards the second half of this year and certainly into 2024. And so they know that it's going to come back. But in the interim time, it's a perfect opportunity to spend some time focused inward and to think about how can we be 
more efficient and more structured and more repeatable in our approach to value creation, especially in a more competitive environment for LPs where you're competing against other funds and you really want to be able to stand out against them. This is a great time to spend time thinking about that. Thank you. And, and the discussion you're having about value creation and how you go about it, I mean, there's so many studies that show so much of the value creation has been through just multiple expansion over the last 10 years, and now as you see multiples not expanding, you see private equity funds and their companies really have to wor work back towards true value creation. How do they make a more valuable business, better EBITDA, really looking at the right key performance indicators and so forth? Does that resonate with what you're looking at? Just so much more focus on operational improvement and growth improvement and how they actually create value at their companies. Yeah, absolutely. We are very much seeing that across the funds that we work with. There has been a great tenure run of, I'll call it easy money, where you could get a long way on some financial engineering and arbitrage, and you didn't really have to work that hard to create the value. I, I know I'm glossing over a lot of effort that's gone into that, so I don't want to minimize for all the funds out there that have been working hard, but it's been a lot easier to achieve the kinds of returns that you want to get to and the sort of IRR on those funds as a direct result of those returns. LPs have become more sophisticated. They are now looking beyond just the financial return in many cases at how that return was achieved, how durable that return will be going forward in the fund, how you'll be able to continue to repeat that. We're seeing the introduction of other factors that might determine exit valuations, certainly things like ESG becoming a more prominent factor and KPI and in the looming suggestion of maybe some government mandates around ESG reporting and reductions, what that might do to exit multiples. So we're seeing a lot more pressure on how you go about achieving the return, not just what the return itself is. And to think about how you do that in a more sustainable, more predictable, risk-reduced fashion. Thank you very, very much. What, what a, a, Jay, anything else? How do people learn more about Sensei Labs? I've seen the name a ton over the years. Congratulations on your success. Thank Let you. Let me ask you one other question. What advice would you give to emerging entrepreneurs, young entrepreneurs? Any thoughts there? What, what, what do you tell somebody who's trying to do what you've done? Yeah, so the first part of your question, you can find out more about us at senselabs.com, S-E-N-S-E-I-L-A-B-S. -E -E you can also follow us on LinkedIn. We do a regular series of webinars. You can find out more information on our website. So if you are in the private equity space, we have a monthly recurring portfolio orchestration webinar. We change the topics around on a month to month basis, but more than welcome to join us for those and you can register for them on our website. In terms of advice to early stage entrepreneurs, I think the biggest thing that people struggle with as an early stage entrepreneur is thinking you are more right than you actually are. And so we really encourage, and we've, we've tried to follow this practice ourselves, but certainly any of the startups that we advise and any of the folks who come to us for advice, really be open to learning what's out there. Inside of your company, there are only opinions. Outside of the company, there are facts. And so heading too far down a path where you are building some opinions will only end up with you learning where you were wrong too late for you to be able to make those corrections. Spend as much time with customers as you can. Try to sell them things as early as you can because every one of those conversations you have will be valuable in you learning things about the market that you're selling into, about the product that you're building, and how you can get to a really tangible outcome faster. Yeah, this is actually so important, this having conversations with customers. I love your point there, Jay, and really understanding, do they really want what you're selling or not, and how do you adjust to make sure you've got that right Venn di diagram of what you're doing versus what they want so these things line up correctly, and, and you can't beat the customer discussions. You can't do this through surveys. You can't do it online. At the end of the day, you have to talk to real people to really hone in on what are you doing? And does somebody really want what you're doing? And, and I, I think I'm, if I'm saying what you're, what you mean, hopefully I'm saying that okay. Uh, but I think that point on customer discussions and really understanding what people want versus what you think they want is so important. Is that is that a fair statement? Yeah, Jay? absolutely. Yeah, a absolutely. I, I think there's been a term certainly within the technology industry of minimum viable product for quite some time now. Came out of this sort of lean startup movement, and we're supporters of minimum viable product, we actually extended a little bit to in, in a, the context of Sensei Labs to minimum lovable product. 
because we want to take those few extra steps, those surprise and delight moments where a customer is going to go from, yes, this meets my needs to, wow, I really love this thing. And so we kind of push it a little bit beyond minimum viable product. But I think it's a, it's a useful framework for people to think through. And I would just encourage you not to just ask the question, would you pay for this? Because it's very easy to answer yes, but actually when presented with an invoice, decide you wouldn't pay for the thing. So I would go a step beyond it, not just to the, is this useful and would you pay for it? But to actually getting people to pay something because money speaks volumes in that context. And if they're willing to put money towards something, there's a good chance you're headed down the right path. But this point is so important, too. You see so many people that do consulting in the way where they offer the free first call, the free this, the first free that. And, and I always think, even if they got somebody to spend 30 cents for the first call, they've got a whole different level of commitment and engagement. We used to let people come to conferences for free. We found if they paid 30 bucks, I mean, versus 1000 bucks versus whatever it was, some actual commitment left everybody far more engaged and far more willing to, this, to, to assess, is this the right thing or not? I think your point about money actually speaking, I don't know if that's, that's so uh, cliche or so old school, but I think there's so much truth to that as well. Jay, I want to thank you for joining us on the Becker Private Equity and Business Podcast. Amazing what you've built, you and your team have built at Sensei Labs, and we're so thrilled to have you on today. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you.